thank you for coming out for our 5x5 five five Live Fest. Uh, and for those of you who have not figured it out yet, uh, that's our little play on the South by Southwest moniker. It stands for 25 years. Five times five is 25. Why is a year? 25 years. Uh, we thought it was really creative, so. Uh, for those of you who are standing, if there's no room, uh, just to let everybody know that we have this piping out live audio outside. So if you want to enjoy the great weather that at this morning I thought we weren't going to have, uh, you can uh, catch us outside as well. Uh, I'm Mike Miller. I'm the manager of the Austin History Center. Uh, this is the official opening of our new exhibit, 5x5Y, five five 25 Years of South by Southwest Music. Uh, this is an exhibit that explores the history and development of what has become a truly an iconic Austin event. Uh, I encourage everyone to take some time during the evening to uh, enjoy the exhibit, uh, check it out. We're going to stay open late. The building will remain open until 10 tonight uh, for people to enjoy the exhibit. So if you have a chance in between, uh, come check it out. Uh, before we begin our program, I want to take a moment uh, to thank a whole bunch of people that helped make this possible. Uh, I, I was just talking with uh, uh, Alan Berg over there about, I'm really getting an appreciation for what the folks who put on South by Southwest every year do. Uh, this, this, we're just doing it once for an afternoon, and I just about killed myself. And these guys do it every year, and they do it for two weeks. I just can't imagine that they do it. Uh, so I do have a, a, a deepened appreciation for what happens with this event. So my first thanks actually goes to the folks at South by Southwest. We approached them about 18 months ago with this idea to uh, uh, do an exhibit uh, in a way to kind of celebrate their 25th uh, year uh, as a way to kind of look at the, the development of live music in Austin. Uh, Austin has now built itself as a live music capital for 20 years. Uh, and it's kind of important to take a, take a step back and look about why that's happened. Uh, uh, what does that mean? Uh, the folks at South Point have been very supportive uh, throughout the whole process. Uh, opening up their offices so we can go dig through things, looking for photographs and film clips and stuff. Uh, uh, I hope we weren't too much of a pest, but uh, uh, it was fun. Uh, I'd like to thank the Parks and Rec Department for allowing us to use Wildridge Square Park uh, for uh, the movies later in the evening. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Downtown Austin Alliance, the Alamo Draft House, uh, and Arts and Labor uh, for uh, making the movies in the park possible. Uh, I would like to thank the city's uh, Communications and Technology Management Office uh, for providing all the audio uh, for the event today. Uh, Austin Energy uh, supplied a solar power trailer to make this whole event uh, a green, sustainable event. So all of our power for this event is being drawn from that. Uh, and then we have a number of nonprofit organizations that will be out in the street during the festival later. Uh, the uh, Recycled Reads, the Library's Bookstore, the Austin History Center Association, uh, the Friends Group for the History Center, the Texas Music Museum, the Revival Fund, the Sims Foundation, and the Health Alliance for Austin Musicians. Uh, and so what, during the evening, if you have a chance, please stop by one of the tables and uh, learn more. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the exhibits team who uh, put all this together. Uh, our photographer, Grace McAvoy, who I have not seen, is she? We can clap for her anyway. She said she was coming, but she's not here. Uh, our exhibits coordinator, Steve Schwollert, is in the back. Steve, raise your hand. Uh, Steve's largely responsible. We kind of bring him a bunch of stuff, and we go, here, Steve, make it look pretty. Uh, and that's what Steve does. So Steve makes it all come together. Uh, and then Tim Hamblin, uh, the curator of this exhibit and the kind of the force behind it. Uh, Tim is over there. Uh, and now uh, you've heard me talk enough. I'd like to invite uh, our, uh, the Honorable uh, Lee Leffingwell, our mayor, to come up and say a few words and present a proclamation. First of all, I want to recognize Mayor Frank Cooksey and his wife, Lynn. Let's give him a big hand. So here we are 25 years later. I was going to explain that five by five way thing to you, but he did such a, such a good job. I was so proud of myself for having figured it out a couple of days ago. Uh, but it is uh, very innovative, as, uh, as is appropriate for South by Southwest. You know, starting off uh, back in uh, the late 1980s, uh, it was a fairly small event, and it has grown. Uh, many of you have seen the graphic outside of this room, back in the, in the main entryway over there, that 
shows how South by Southwest has grown over the years from just a few hundred people initially to now over 13,000 people. And it is uh, one of the premier events, not only in Austin, but in the entire world. It is marked from a music event into an event that includes film festivals and also interactive media. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, to the point where uh, notably in 2007, uh, some of you may have heard of Twitter. Twitter was introduced here at South by Southwest in 2007. So that's a kind of world renowned. People come from all over the world to this event. Uh, economic input to the city of Austin, uh, economic impact to the city of Austin is was last year well over $110 million and it's still growing. So uh, I, I don't care what whether you like this other stuff or not, you've got to listen to those kind of numbers and realize how important, how important this industry is to Austin. Music is a billion dollar a year industry in Austin, Texas. Some of you, uh, like me, are old enough to remember that back in 1991, by action of the Austin City Council, uh, we declared ourselves live music capital of the world. So, uh, and and there was there was merit to it. We believe there still is. We still have uh, 250 live music venues here in the city. Uh, that's more than any uh, other city in the world per capita on a per capita basis. We have about 50,000 performances, music performances here every year. So it's a uh, huge business, and it's really put Austin on the map and led to all of these other things that South by Southwest uh, has become. So with that, I know you've got a very interesting panel uh, of folks who have been uh, historic Austin figures on the music scene, and you're looking forward to hearing from them. So I'm gonna, I, I just want to honor this particular event here, uh, this exhibit with the proclamation, which, if you'll indulge me, I'll just read to you. It says, be it known that whereas 5X by 5Y, 25 years of South by Southwest music, is a new Austin History Center exhibit that delves into the origins of South by Southwest and Austin's efforts to position itself as the live music capital of the world. And whereas 5X by 5Y, 5X 5Y Fest marks the opening of the exhibit and offers a taste of excitement and energy generated by South by Southwest with a panel discussion by two founders of South by Southwest, a free concert, films and food booths, and whereas one of the featured bands, Why Not Satellite, is made up of members who played in the first South by Southwest Music Festival or at the New Music Seminar in New York that inspired South by Southwest. The films include a new documentary of the 25 years of South by Southwest and a restored Chamber of Commerce film about Austin from 1943. <laughs> now therefore, I, Lee Leffenwell, Mayor of the City of Austin, Texas, do urge Austinites to see the exhibit, enjoy the festival, and do hereby proclaim March 5th, 2011, is 25 years of South by Southwest history in Austin, Texas. So congratulations. <laughs>
1986 travelled to New York <coughs> to New York to attend the New Music Seminar, where the idea of the Regional Music Conference was first conceived. So I'm honoured to introduce Roland Swenson, co-founder and managing director of South by Southwest.
see it or, and, you know, talk to each other and hang out and drink a lot of beer. The incredible things come from it, and, and it's always awkward to claim that when you're involved, but it's, you can see it from so many other people claiming it, from so many other people writing about it. And I've always thought that what South by Southwest really is about is that um, media of all kinds is an art form and it's a business. And what South by Southwest is about is learning both how to do the best creative work you can do, but also learning about the business, because the more you know about the business, the more you control your own work. And it's the end, you know, and so I think it's always been that, and, and that started with a little regional event, and now it's spread to an international event, and it started with music, and it's now you know, film and, and new media. But I really do think it's about uh, you controlling your own work. And that doesn't mean not selling it to a, a major studio or something. It just means you get to decide what to do. That, that's an interesting evolution because it used to be you were supposed to get con in contact with the big boys, but now it's being the big boys yourself. What, when and where was the seed planted? When, when did this idea come about? And what, what, what was behind it? Why, why did you do something like this? Um, well, you know, we mentioned the music seminar, which was an event in, uh, held in New York City uh, that started, I think, in 1979. And I attended the first time in, I think it was 1982, and uh, was really amazed at, at, you know, how many opportunities were, you know, there in, in this one space. And there were all these people that, you know, you could, you could never get them on the phone, but there they were. You could talk to them. So uh, the, the first day I was there, uh, you know, I, I, I had, it started out, I, I went down to their offices to try to talk them into booking the, the band that I managed. <laughs> and uh, I managed to talk my way into uh, Mark Josephson's office and, you know, gave him my pitch. And, and he didn't book my band, but he, he sold me uh, a $75 Badge for the seminar, <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 I took the badge and I, I was I was living in New York with with the band The Standing Waves, and so I went back to the apartment and it was it was like Jack and the Beanstalk. I had taken the gold and, and bought these magic beans, so they were pretty pretty skeptical. <laughs> so uh, so anyway, so I, I was I was under the gun to show some results. Uh, so when I went the first day, I. I I saw this guy, I was in an elevator, and, and there was this guy in the corner, Seth Hurwitz, who booked uh, a club in New York called the 930, I mean in uh, Washington, D.C., called the 930 Club. And I, I'd been chasing him for a gig for months, and there he was right next to me. So I, you know, I started pitching him, and uh, I walked out of the gig, with, uh, out of the elevator with a $200 gig. So I'd, I'd recoup my money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the rest was gravy, and, uh, you know, and then the rest of the week, I. I went to all the New York clubs that I could never get into in <laughs> before, and I could walk right in. So, and, and that was the, the thing that brought everybody there. It was, wasn't just the music, it was the ability to you know, go and hear all of these bands uh, that were playing in like you know, 30 different clubs around New York. And I thought, well, you know, I, I club hop in Austin all the time. You know, I'll go see three shows a night. You know, and, and they're certainly a lot closer together in Austin than they are in New York. I mean, something like this could work in Austin. So I think that was maybe the first time that, that I thought about it. But, you know, I didn't really think that I could do it. You know, I just thought that maybe it could happen. So what, what prompted uh, you to do your deal with, uh, to get Lewis at the table on this? <laughs> what, when, when did Roland come to you with this idea that, uh, Well, the New Music Seminar guys thought about doing a regional event in Austin, so they had come to town and met with everybody. And sometime after that, uh, Roland and Lewis Myers came to Nick and I and said, why don't we do an event? And Nick said, mm -hmm. and I said, no, that's a terrible idea. Always ahead of the curve. <laughs> and, uh, and Roland, we were talking about going, we, we were bi-weekly that point. And we were talking about going weekly uh, in that fall, and we would have to do this event in the cash flow of the Chronicle, and calling it flow is exaggerating its movement. Um, 
But we talked about it for a, um, a long time, and it just seemed everybody began to get the same idea in their head. Uh, one of the things Nick Barbaro likes to do is spend endless hours talking about things. <laughs> endless hours. And, uh, but once it began to, I think, be in all our heads, and it certainly was, Roland had a much better picture of it than Nick and I, um, it began to make sense. And so, uh, and then as soon as they said softball and barbecue, I knew I was, my goose was cooked, we were gonna do it. So I got on board, because Nick you know, loves a good softball game. So when did this agreement come? What, what time of the year was it? Was it in 1996, 87? It was actually right around Thanksgiving in 1986 that we started, a little bit before that we started talking about it. And right after that, beginning of December, we decided to do it, didn't we? Right. Yeah, something, uh, we actually tracked down the date, and I think it was early December when we made the first public announcements. But we've been talking about it since, I think, late August. Uh, you know, part of the story is that the, the guys from the seminar were recruited to come down here by the uh, Convention of Visitors Bureau, uh, and who at that time were part of the Chamber of Commerce. And so, you know, part of what they did was recruit new business. So uh, there had been this group of us that had been working with uh, the Convention of Visitors Bureau um, with the to promote the idea of Austin as a, a, a tourist destination for people who love music. So anyway, so they, they brought the seminar guys down here you know, they thought, well, this could work, and, and then they actually went as far as to announce that they were going to do it, and then... Thank few, God for cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> a few months later, they were like, well, uh, no, we're not going to do it now, but maybe we'll do it sometime later. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you. And, and so it was really at that point that, that Lewis Myers and I were like, you know, we don't need these guys from New York. We can do this. And, and so then we went to Nick and Lewis, and it, it took a while to convince them, but once they were on board. Did you and Lewis Myers have to convince yourselves first before you went to them? I mean, just that this was viable, or were y'all just sitting around, yeah, well, what else are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, part of it was that, that you know, the, when the seminar guys came to town, it became really obvious that we were not going to play any part at all. <laughs> so uh, they, they sort of packed it with other people, not us. You know, we had them up to the So, so if, for us, it was like seizing the opportunity because we felt like, you know, this could happen. You know, if it's going to happen, we want to we want to be in on it. We want to have a say in, in you know how it goes. But I want to give credit where credit's due. Who was it? The CVB that made it happen. I, I remember in the late seventies calling them up when I was working at the Statesman and asking them to put an economic value of music on the city because they were putting figures on everything. And the answer was, we don't know. So. Something must have changed. It was a historic divide between alternative culture and city leadership, but uh, something changed there. Well, the, at the time, the, the head of the Commission of Visitors Bureau was a guy named David Lord. And, and David was a really smart guy. And, you know, he, was, he was definitely a suit. You know, he was very straight. Um, but he'd been a, a bartender at the Texas Chili Bar. So you know, <laughs> he, he, he knew what what the deal was, you know, with Austin, and and recognize the value of, of you know the music and the, the culture that was at that point really kind of still under the radar uh, for for most of the city. So um, you know he and, and he got together with this guy named Ernie Gamage, who uh, was a successful musician here, and, and they hit it off, and this whole series of events un unfolded. Sort of united all the different parts of the Austin music scene for the first time uh, through a series of meetings where we got we got all the studio owners in a room together and that had never happened. And we got all the club owners in a room together and, and that had never happened. And we got everybody that was you know had record companies or management companies together to talk about you know what you know what what's going to happen to the Austin music scene you know if it keeps going the way it's going now, which at the time. You know, uh, the Austin real estate was, was starting to, you know, price a lot of clubs out of central Austin. And there were a lot of new people moving to Austin, and, and they weren't aware of, you know, the option of going out to hear live music. So, you know, we, we were worried about, you know, the whole thing kind of getting steamrolled in the, in the, the coming and 
explosion of growth in Austin. So that that was that was part of why we were, you know, felt this urgency to do something. So you guys get together. We're going to do this. What do you do? I mean, how do you organize an event like this uh, when you've never done it before? Well, we would spend after the, the paper went to press that night, but also almost every night we would sit around the office, usually just four of us, sometimes other friends, and talk for hours about what it was going to be. And it literally got to the point where, um, you know, we were going, okay, so, so somebody lands at the airport, what happens next? And you can always count on Nick, who's not here, but to come up with, with like the suggestion that makes you all group together. And again, like when he said, well, why don't we do this at the YMCA and everybody can sleep on the floor? <laughs> you remember that? But it, it was one of those. Like something we considered. <laughs> it brought me to the hotel real quickly. <laughs> well, you know, the the process that we went through, which you know, was everything was done more or less by consensus. So we, you know, we would have to argue every point, you know, to the nth degree. And you know, even though it was painful, you know, it, it really kind of polished everything. So, you know, th there were certain things we knew. We knew we needed a, a program that had uh, edu educational uh, component to it. Uh, we knew that we needed uh, artists playing in, in nightclubs, and, and we, we knew that there needed to be, you know, one pass that got you into all of these things. So just kind of building from, from those, those ideas, you know, we, we put it together. And what was it, the Hyatt Hotel, two conventions? Wait, what the first one was? Well, we, we were going to do it at the, uh, the LBJ school, at the, uh, the um, music collection there. And, and, you know, they've got some meeting rooms and stuff. But So we were like, waited around for months and months to get approval from UT, and that never happened. And then finally, a couple of months out, uh, I went down to, at the time, it was the Marriott. Now it's the Sheraton. On the peak night, I think, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you're going to put on this event. Two things. How do, you, how do you sell this to your target audience, and how do you sell it to the city? Are they buying in all the way? Roland really um, brilliantly <laughs> suggested very early on that we bring in other weeklies like ourselves as co-sponsors, and they could each have a band, and they would have a vested interest in this event in Austin, even though it was a regional event, it was taking place in Austin because they were brought in as co-sponsors. So I think we got like 14 papers from around the area. And that man instantly, I mean, we had, the change was, you know, we gave him registration for advertising. So suddenly we had, you know, regional pre presence right off. And, um, and to this day, we, we maintain that network. It's not as valuable as it once was. Um, but early on, Crucial, really and then what it also did was um, the secondary thing it did was all the music writers from the weeklies began showing up in South by Southwest. And first it was the papers that were co-sponsored, but after a while it was like everybody um, from all all the weeklies, which led to people from the slicks and the monthlies. So it became very much a, a music writers convention as well um, because of this initial idea of the co-sponsored. It was a music and media conference, uh, I seem to recall. Yes. So that was yes. the uh, bringing together all the all, all papers. Yeah, and we have papers like the Dallas, uh, Dallas Observer, uh, Westward in Denver, um, the Houston mm. Press. Were they around? Houston there? Press. Uh, uh, wait, we might have. All right. Well, actually, it's in this book right here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many papers coming in and out of business. But, uh, and, and a lot of those people got it immediately. I mean, and we're into it. Well, I mean, part of it for me, you know, uh, with my background of, of managing and booking, you know, local bands, you know, it, it was hard for Austin bands to get shows in Dallas. It was hard for Dallas bands to get shows in Austin. It was hard to get a gig in New Orleans. It was hard for people in New Orleans to get a gig here. 
So you know, we felt like if we could bring these key players from all these cities together, that it would create a bigger market for all the hats. And uh, and that really happened. And you know, the the scenes were very parochial at the time. You know, the Dallas clubs were like, why should we vote in Austin band? And, and the Austin clubs were even worse about you know voting <coughs> out of town bands. So I think that was the first significant thing that happened was that suddenly the options for from the whole five-state area, you know, just increased dramatically. And that first year, uh, did the panels work? I mean, did, did you see results with the educational component, and did you see results with the music component? You know, that, that turned out pretty good, actually, considering we, you know, really didn't know what we were doing. Uh, you know, but th there were a few obvious things for us to do. For You know, there was this group, to book three, who uh, had had a top 20 hit with a song that uh, <laughs> called The Future So Bright, I Gotta Wear Shade. So I think our, our opening uh, panel was sort of a case study of, of how they you know, got started and how they got their record deal and what had happened to them you know, subsequently. Uh, and, and then we had uh, Huey Mo, who was a famous uh, producer. <laughs> Spoke, he spoke the truth. Joe Nick, Joe Nick was an old associate of uh, Mr. Mose, and that's how I, how I met him. Uh, uh, but one of the things that happened really late in the game was, you know, we about three weeks out, suddenly we had all these guys from major labels who were A&R guys who were signing up. And you know, pretty soon we had one from every major label. So about two weeks out, I sent him a, a letter that said, greetings, you have been drafted to be on a panel South by Southwest, <laughs> and, uh, and they all said yes. <laughs> so really at the very last minute we put this panel together that had you know, some really powerful record company people on it. And that kind of blew people's minds because you know, A&R people in Austin was a pretty rare thing at the time. Roland would have us, there were some people who hadn't registered, and Roland would have us call them and ask if they would be on a panel. And then when we gave we said, well, and will you buy a registration? <laughs> There's all that record company money. They don't, it doesn't come out of their pockets. And I would have actually get almost all the speakers to pay. And, and most of them did. I don't think I would do that today, but it was. We, we might have should have stuck to that. <laughs> it's kind of changed the way it goes now. Everybody's always trying to lobby you to get on the panel. Is that not? Well, that, that started happening pretty early. Okay, was the end of the first year, was it the softball game at the end, or did you do it the first year? We did the softball game the first year. Uh, Lewis Myers had forgot to get the permit, or had done something with the permit, so there were other people playing there. So he threatened them with violence, as I recall. And then we had Stubb serving barbecue, and he brought all the barbecue, but he didn't bring any serving utensils. <laughs> so yeah, some people were like using paper plates to like dip beans out of the fire. And, uh, And then at the very end, a uh, car pulled up, like a car out of two guys in it, and they said, oh, we're South by Southwest, we want to go to, and it was like, um, I kind of missed it. But at the end, did you all well, one, of the, one of the great moments was this, uh, this a &R guy from New York, and he's like eating this rib, he goes, so that's what barbecue is supposed to taste like. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, we started out saying, well, if we could get 150 people, we'll be okay. And we, we, we had 700 registers the first year. So uh, we, we, knew, we knew we had lightning in a bottle. And, and uh, at that point, and, and really ever since, it's been, you know, how can we not screw this up? So, you know. Who picked March? I mean, this is my middle March. I, I, I don't remember. I think it's because the music awards were in either February or March, and we decided to forget to the music awards and to I mean, at that point, the the club scene was really dependent on uh, UT, and the week of UT spring break was the deadest weekend of the year. So for us to go to all these clubs and say, hey, give us your stage and let us book acts on it, they didn't really have that much to lose, you know, because nobody was going to be there anyways. So when we came along and, and brought a bunch of people in, you know, it was a, they, were, they were happy. That's I, 
that was probably the last time they were happy. <laughs> now it's the biggest weekend of the year for them, and, and, they, and they've been brought just everything. Um, <laughs> That's not true. They love right, no, they love us. We love yeah. them. We love them. When, when did you realize, was there a moment when you realized this is a big deal? I think it was uh, the Joe Ely concert when Mullen and I were trying to look for body bags. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, everybody kept saying, you need to have an after hours party, you need to have an after hours party. So we, we, we had Joe Ely play in the, the ballroom uh, at the Sheridan Crest, which is now the Radisson. And uh, <coughs> Lewis and I got there and you know, we had arranged for security, but they had not shown up. <laughs> so, Screaming in off the street, you know, and running up the steps to the ballroom. And so, like, Lewis and I are like linking arms, going, like, Stop, stop, stop. And they're just running right over us. And they're climbing on chairs. I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah. it looked like and, a uh, chaotic situation. And so, we, we put like a really low stage in, in there, and, 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 and the ceiling was low. So, unless you were standing right in front of the stage, you, you could not see Joe Ely. Uh, but, but it sounded really good, and everybody had a good time. And, and Joe Ely's just furious at us. He was screaming at us. But um, Joe got a record deal from that night. <laughs> Tony Brown, um, who was the head of MCA National and, and had also been uh, Elvis Presley's um, piano player, was, was in the audience and saw, saw Ely and, and signed to MCA. And Ken Levitan has loved us ever since, who was Joe's manager at the time in Half Lyles. Uh, get get on to tell about the hotel in a second. Yeah, what about the hotel in the second year? Where, where was that? Well, this is kind of a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Uh, so the, uh, the Marriott was too small, so there was this new hotel that was built. It was called the Waller Creek. And you know, it, was, it was really nice. It had like two ballrooms on, on one side of the creek and the hotel on the other. So we, you know, we made a deal with them, and you know, everything, it was going to be great. And so about four months in front of the event, I went down there one day and, and there, there was a bridge across the creek and it was all boarded up. And I said, hey, you know, what's the deal with the, the, other, the, the rest of the hotel? And they're like, oh, don't worry about that. It, it'll be fixed. No problem. No problem. And, you know, so every month I would go down there and, and the board, you know, it was still boarded up. And, and they kept saying, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And finally, I, I picked up the phone and, and called across to this other building. And it, what, what had happened is they, they'd gone bankrupt. And uh, the guy that built the hotel had lost the hotel, but he kept this office building on the other side of the creek. And so I called him up and said, hey, so when are you guys going to make a deal on, on, with the hotel? And they're like, when hell freezes over, we'll make a deal with the hotel. And I'm like, oh, my God. So uh, I, I, you know, and, and we were like a, you know, a month out, and suddenly we did not have a hotel that had ballrooms. So I, I went to the Four Seasons, which was like the closest hotel at the time. And, and uh, I, I got into one of the salesmen and, and pitched him on it. And he was like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And so, so we, you know, we worked out the deal. And, and then just where I leave, I said, now, you know, you understand that there's going to be a lot of people wearing leather jackets. And <laughs> it's gonna, you know, it's going to be kind of a rock and roll crowd. Lots of and, and you, people are going to be okay with that because, you know, we had problems with the Marriott because they kind of freaked out. <laughs> Uh, and the guy was like, oh, yeah, no problem, no problem. So I drove back to the Chronicle, and I said, okay, problem solved. We got, we're at the Four Seasons. Phone rings. The guy's on the phone. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> so I got back in my car and drove down to the Sherry Crest, and, which was a much more kind of seedy place at the time. And they, they took us in cheerfully. And it, it was Except then we did the mailing announcing it. And right. the day after the mailing went out in the statesman was an article about how the crest was no longer going to be a show. Yeah, the Sheraton divorced them. The and so it's just going to be the crest. So it was like, no. And, and then the Sheraton like put their flag on another hotel. So we told all these people, you know, it was at the Sheraton, but it wasn't really at the Sheraton. It was at the other hotel. But, and then when we, you know, and then the hotel was kind of, it was falling apart really. And so we had this, we had this one scene where you know, we had, it was all divided up. The, the ballroom was divided up into different rooms. And, and then there were separate sound systems for each room. And so at one point, we couldn't get the sound to work in, in one room, but it was 
actually all going into another <laughs> so, so, you know, the, the record company people are in there trying to talk, and the, the people from the publicity next door, that's what's coming over the, over the sound system. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a mess, but it was okay. What did your parents think? <laughs> I don't know, my mom's You didn't get any feedback? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, for my family, you know, that they, I know that my grandmother, for example, never really understood what, what it was that I, I did. You know, it was, it, it was always very confusing to her. Um, but, you know, I, I, I had this sort of modely career in, in music for six or seven years, so I think, you know, pretty much anything I did that was modely successful, they were kind of believing, you know. <laughs> well, the Chronicle was about five or six years old when, when I started it, and uh, my dad was still waiting for me to get a job. Job. And so this made no difference to him. It just seemed like more foolishness. Uh, I'm just curious. Give me one or two questions that people always ask you. And what is the most frequently asked your FAQs? What's the top one or two? What's the quick answers? Do you work on this all year long? <laughs> and you answer this? Uh, no, we usually get together a few weeks out and just decide, <laughs> <laughs> just decide where we're going to put things. And then they go, really? And I go, yeah. We're, we're, we're working on uh, in 2012 and 13 and 14 now. I mean, in a lot of ways, there are commitments that are made that far out now. Now, when, when you're in a strange place, you're not in Austin, and you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm involved with South by Southwest. Who got signed? Got signed. They were always saying which band's got signed. And what do you tell them? We say we have, you know, we're uh, adults in this business, and it isn't like somebody goes in, very rarely somebody go in and see a band and sign them. Either they go and see a band and get excited about them and follow them for a while and then sign them, or they may have been following a band for a while and then they see them South by Southwest and sign them. But in point of fact, there were actually, we know cases where somebody walked in and saw a band and signed them, but we, it, it just gets to be like, we didn't want to talk, we didn't want to brag on that. So uh, essentially, at some point later in the game, it was, uh, we put out some lists and it was always from bands that said, South by Southwest changed our career. So it wasn't us, it was them. It's interesting now, I mean, it started, you were this connection to the, the business, and that business is gone. And there's more people, more bands coming to that. I mean, how, how do you square that? Well, uh, you know, the whole thing about, you know, bands going to South by Southwest and, and getting signed was, you know, I, I always hated that. I always hated that. Because, you know, for me, South by Southwest was designed to be a promotional tool for all kinds of acts, new and established. You know, because I'd worked for, for bands that had no, no record deal at all. I'd, I'd worked with bands that had, like, an indie deal. I'd worked with bands that had a major deal. And, and they, they all needed the same thing, which was attention. And, and that's what South by Southwest was supposed to do, was to draw attention to them. Um, so, you know, we would, we would never, you know, whenever I was asked, you know, did so-and-so get signed, I would say, no, they got signed because, you know, they're a good band or their manager's smart or, or they were lucky. You know, I never, never said it was because of South by Southwest. We would say, and the one, we, honestly, we would say a lot was, the way we look at South by Southwest is to take the band to the next level. So if it's a band that's only played regionally, maybe it'll play in a different region. If it's a band that's played nationally, maybe we'll get some overseas gig. If it's a band that's just played locally, maybe we'll get booked regionally. And with media people there and record store people there and, and uh, um, you know, and more, most importantly, the other bands. Because every band was on a bill with four or five other bands. And if some band was hot, it would spread across all those bands real quickly. So the whole idea was kind of to, to change the rules of the game. Not that that was the idea, but <laughs> I think that's what happened. And I also think that, um, you know, it, it turned out to be, South by Southwest has turned out to be the model event for the post-record company, post-film studio world, where more and more people have to do it on their own. And South by Southwest has always been about those tools. So is it turned into spring break for Alt Nation? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, really, since, since it was designed to be this promotional vehicle, and that's still what artists of all types need is promotion. That's more or less why we've survived as, you know, the record industry has collapsed, was, you know, there's, 
there's still lots of, of bands that are popular and, and sell lots of tickets and and you know I, and there always will be uh, so what we're able to do is, is help them you know tap into <coughs> other kinds of revenue you know you know whether it's getting your music in a commercial or uh, making a deal with a brand uh, to, to be sponsored That's why people, that's why, at least for the music part, that's why, you know, we haven't collapsed along with the rest of the, the music industry. You've really grown it. I mean, we're talking about music right now, but um, then came film, then came interactive, uh, and there's all, Twitter was mentioned earlier. What, what is the most transformative element that you've seen as this thing's evolved into what it is today from what you started out? Well, you know, a really critical thing that we did was in, in 1994, um, you know, we, we were sitting around saying, okay, so what's what's entertainment going to be like in the 21st century? You know, we didn't know. But, you know, we figured out that it was going to probably involve music. It was probably going to involve moving images. And it was probably going to involve some kind of interactivity, you know, like games or, or whatever. So, and, and, you know, this was before the web. This was before email. <coughs> CD-ROMs. CD-ROMs were, were, were that was a big So, you know, because we kind of got started then, you know, that has enabled us to, you know, you know change along with, with, with everything else. And Nick and I um, met in graduate film school. A lot of us met in, in, as graduate, graduate film students. Or our under, uh, Roland was an undergraduate film student. Brent Brokey was an undergraduate film student. So a lot of us were film students. So. By 94, when we were kind of stable as a music event, we thought it'd be really, you know, one, looking to the future, and two, we thought, you know, we're film people, let's have a little film festival. And I really swear, I thought it was going to be a, a nice little boutique film festival that would show regional independent films. And I really didn't count on uh, how much you, it meant that Link Letter, Rick Linkletter had stayed in town, and Robert Rodriguez and Elizabeth Avion had moved back to town, Mike Judge moved to town, Guillermo yeah, Del Toro lived here for a while. Paul Steckler was hired by the university. So that by like 98, which was the fourth year, I think, or fifth year, uh, among other people at the event was, it was Quentin Tarantino, Kevin Smith, Steven Soderbergh, Rick Linkletter, Robert Rodriguez, Elizabeth Avion, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm leaving some out. Um, but it literally was one of those, oh, Guillermo Del Toro was there. It was where they were making jokes about how if the roof fell in, it was going to wipe out the uh, indie film business. And, uh, that, that's when it became the Friends of Lewis Black Film Festival. <laughs> <laughs> that, Friends of Rick Lincoln. That, that kind of critical mass, it, has it ever gotten scary where it's like this thing's building beyond the point? It's been scary all along. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, but this, I think it's amazing to come up with this idea from 25 years ago. And y'all are still with it. I mean, most things that have grown exponentially like this thing, uh, the founders would have been long gone, or you all are supposed to be playing golf or, uh, you know, living like in a Caribbean resort or something. Yeah, we're, we're adrenaline junkies. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and we're also, I mean, what I love about South by Southwest is the people who put it on are totally driven by a passion for media. They're driven by love of film and music and, and, and new media. And it's not, I mean, sometimes you go by the music fest and they're throwing chairs at each other because somebody wants to bring a band that somebody else doesn't think they should bring. There's a level of passion that's there all the time. Roland still will occasionally, you know, give me a CD. Not, not burn, of course, purchase. <laughs> um, but we give each other CDs because we're, that's what it's about. I'm, with some regularity, not every year, but every second or third year I go to Waterloo two or three days afterwards because you know, the event's over, and I get to reward myself by buying more CDs. Um, not that I need them, but I'm, you know, because there's still some little bit of space in the house for more CDs. And I always, whenever I do it, I run into Brent Grubby, who's there buying CDs. And it's just like, that's what we do. You know, I mean, we love music. We haven't gotten jaded. We love the event. And when you're in the middle of it, the energy of the event is astonishing. It's like, it's, it's something else entirely. It, it's much more than some of its parts. And it, you know, I know it's for me. It's my favorite time of the year. I love the people we get to work with. I love the fact the integrity behind it, and um, 
And so I think that that really has kept me going. Plus, having Roland as our, our leader, I mean, Roland's been a visionary through the whole thing, and he always he's always about three or four steps ahead of us, and five or six steps ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> when does the adrenaline kick in? I mean, is there a point where it's like, oh, here we go? Yeah, today, actually. <laughs> <laughs> In the early days, we used to, you know, sneak off to smoke pot, and now we sneak off to take naps. <laughs> I'll, I'll say, you know, there's an emergency one of the theaters. I've got to go now. I'll be back in about an hour. <laughs> now, uh, I remember in, it must have been late 80s, early 90s, uh, I moderated a Kennedy panel, and it was very successful. I remember as we walked outside, Roland said, well, you know, we do conventions. And... Thus began the ASK, the Assassination Symposium on John F. Kennedy. What's your biggest regret as far as a commitment that you've made in trying to do this? Because I think ASK may be a success or maybe not so much, but what do you really regret doing? ASK I was totally fun. If you misspelled somebody's name on the badge, they want to know why. They <laughs> got badges, they didn't want to put their names on them. They want to know, I mean, they, um, you know, uh, 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 towards the end, uh, it peaked at one point, and, and, and we're now named in books as part of the conspiracy. <laughs> that was really why we had to stop, was they, they discovered that we had actually organized the hotels, planes, and rental cars for the assassination team. And, uh, once, once our cover was blown, we had to stop. Doing it. I, I got to shake hands with Marina Oswald. We, yeah, we met a lot of interesting people. Uh, Norman Mailer came. Yeah. Uh, Marina Oswald, uh, I hung out with one of the guys handcuffed to Lee Harvey Oswald when he was <laughs> shot. Uh, My favorite thing was Marina Oswald was talking in the hall, and she's like surrounded by 20 guys who were all asking questions. And somebody asked her about the photo of uh, Lee Harvey in the back door with a rifle, which they all know is doctored. And she said, oh, no, no, I was there. It was, it was taken. Uh, and, and they ignored it and kept on going. <laughs> No, but you did, did you try to do an element with South by Southwest that didn't work, and you said, uh, never again? Battle of the Bands. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we tried a lot of things that flopped. You know, we're not, fortunately, those aren't as well remembered. What, what's, what's the best insult you've been paid? South by Southwest, SX, SW sucks. See, but, but we made those shirts. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> we sold them, and we made good money. <laughs> okay, what's the nicest compliment you've been paid by someone? That you kind of, you know, hey, this is, this is why I do this. You know, I'm just always surprised when I'm, you know, in some faraway place. I, I was in Australia with my family about, I don't know, four or five years ago. And uh, so I took my daughter to uh, the aquarium. And, you know, they had one of these things where it's like a green screen and you stand in front of it and they, they project you like with a shark movie or something. Um, and I was, I was wearing my South by Southwest jacket and, you know, this, there's a girl running this concession and goes, oh, South by Southwest, I love that, you know. And, and my, my kid was impressed. So I think that was, <laughs> I think that was, you know, maybe one of the best things that happened. To me. My kid's still not impressed. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's, I was a, didn't have a dinner big sir at a restaurant with my friend Maggie and we were talking about Texas and the waitress comes over and starts talking about South by Southwest. I was having dinner somewhere else in California with my sister. Waitress comes over and starts talking about South by Southwest. I'm pretty sure we didn't expect that in the first place. And then in Mojo, I quoted this in the column in Chronicle a couple of weeks ago, but in Mojo there was this whole thing about how it was like a star is born because uh, this guy whose band was falling apart was waiting online, and this young man fell in love with him and um, ended up, his band fell apart, but they got him to record an album which was in the top 10 British albums. And in all the British music publications, it was, uh, again, I wish I would remember the guy's name, the story would be so much better. But, um, <laughs> but it, you know, Mojo picked it as the number one album, and it literally said they met online at South by Southwest, and they continued that relationship, and that's why this guy's career resurrected. That's cool. I, I really like the fact it's become international in scope. What's your favorite, who's been your favorite international artist, such as it were? Mirko. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. Mirko Whitfield is uh, one of our, our uh, international reps. He's based in Germany. And uh, Louis, 
Lewis loves Mirko because at one point, when, when Mirko was, had his, his first child, his wife was living in Germany and Mirko was living in Hong Kong. And so he, he traced his hand on a piece of paper and he faxed it to his wife on the day of his birth. And Lewis was so impressed that he had managed to be on another continent when, <laughs> when, his, when his kid was born. Did you he put, did, did you get some, something like touching you or, you know? Yeah, or yeah, you, yeah. I was like, no, that's smart. <laughs> okay, but what about bands? I mean, how, how strange has it gotten? We, uh, so there was a band from behind the Iron Curtain and came to the office Monday morning and they were in the field, they were ready to defect and wanted our help. Uh, and what did you do? Well, they, they, they sat around in the yard for like two or three days. <laughs> <laughs> we, we kept trying to convince them that, you know, being in America was probably not going to work out for them. They had they'd flown into Miami and, and bought a, a, a van from a, the bellboy at their hotel. <laughs> and they, they'd driven the van to Austin, and then they were, you know, it, it was falling apart. And we said, you know, you really ought to just, you know, sell this and take the bus back to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so they, but they were insulted because they, they, someone told them that only lower class people rode the bus in the United States. So after that, they were offended and they left. But <laughs> Where did you find the Mongolian throat singers? Oh, I actually saw that guy in Berlin, and he was so cool. I, you know, I was really excited when we, when we had him. Uh, Yat Va. And the uh, Becca sign, I hate to say anything nice about the state's music commissioner, but um, a band showed up from Becca sign in traditional costumes and, and stuff, and they didn't have a showcase. And Casey Monahan was working registration, and by the time anybody and for management heard about it, they had a showcase, they were on the John Haley show, and they had a paid gig. And it was one of those things where the people who we work with are so good, and they also love the music, and they love film, that there's a level of commitment that, you know, brings a tear to your eye. But no, the Uzbekistani thing was pretty great, because I walked in late in the game, and there's all these bizarre instruments and these guys in strange costumes. After the softball tournament, I, I remember when Sunday, afternoon I swung by Casey's house and there he was out front in a Uzbeki robe and they were playing Uzbeki music in the backyard and I thought, you know, this is this is not happening in most cities in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Where's this going? I have a, twin, a son who's going to be 21 in July and I have just about as much an idea where he's going as I do where this is going. <laughs> it's very much its own entity. Uh, it very much has surprised us many times as where it grew. Uh, grew. There's a, I mean, the staff is great. It's not, not, you know, it's not thrown out in the snow, but uh, I'm, I'm frequently surprised where it's going. I don't think Roland is surprised nearly as much as I am. Well, you know, we really, we sort of mentioned the staff, uh, you know, and there's like almost 100 of us now that work on this thing year-round. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're really driving this at this point, you know, because, you know, we've got all these really smart, We've got a lot of smart people who used to be young that are still with <laughs> us. Uh, and, you know, I mean, they're the reason that, that we survived, you know, because <coughs> there was this, this guy who's one of my, my mentors early on. His name was uh, Roger Sobine, and uh, his dad was Red Sobine. And, uh, and, and he said, Roland, if you, if you want to be successful, keep young people around. You know, so I, and I, I took that to heart, and so there's a lot of, you know, young people at South by Southwest who, you know, I, I, I find myself telling stories when and they go, oh, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, they, they're the ones that, that, you know, know about these things like Twitter, you know, <laughs> what, you know, before I did, I mean, I was like, what, Twitter, what's that? You know, mm. you know. Uh, so I, I think, you know, if, if if we've survived and, and we've grown, it's because uh, Lewis and I are, are willing to, to let people, you know, go after their their vision. And Nick in charge. And Nick too. If you look at like the photo exhibit here, to, to my mind, all looks like is a study in decomposition from a horror movie. <laughs> 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 
started out as fairly fresh-faced and young, and now with like, you know, with the Night of the Living Corpses. Um, I can't. The pictures really depress me, but it was obvious that we haven't done. We haven't age that well. Brent Brogy and I had talked recently about how neither one of us expected to make it this long, so we hadn't taken some precautions we might have. Um, so that's why you need to get people. You know, one, you need their blood. <laughs> all right, Greg. And they're, they're like much more concerned about things than I am right now. They're, they're all back in the office worrying, and I'm, I'm here chatting. You know. Well, I want to throw this open. Uh, if y'all have some questions, the only one that I won't accept is why wasn't my band chosen? <laughs> uh, but if y'all have any questions, uh, raise your hand, please, as so we can. Uh, these guys can answer. Questions? No questions. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's been pretty interesting the way that's evolved. Um, you know, at one point we, we had to open like 5,000 packages and with CDs and, you know, and organize them. And, um, you know, now everybody uploads their music to our website. And, you know, one of the things that does for us is we're able to have people literally around the world to help us listen. So every act that applies gets listened to by at least two different people uh, who, who you know, we've selected because we, we think they have good taste. And uh, they, they grade them on like a five-point criteria, originality, songwriting ability, technical expertise, career development. Uh, I can't remember what the fifth one is. Uh, and, and, you know, give them a grade. And then we even have like a formula that, you know, takes them to Somebody gives them a one, and somebody else gives them a five. You know what? what you know that kicks it out as being an anomaly. So it's a fairly sophisticated system. So we, you know we take the the acts that you know scored the highest, and then the staff here in Austin listens to those, and we make our choices that way. But you know beyond the the application process, you know we also aggressively go out and. institutions to, uh, to, to do showcases here, you know, because that brings in more industry people to see the acts. So it's sort of a multi-pronged process. But the, but the Music Fest people still end up listening to thousands of bands to decide which ones are going to play. And like the film people, same thing. It's, it either goes out for ju other people to jury, but then they get 4,000 movies. They end up watching 1,500, 2,000 of them kind of pick which ones and um, and sometimes I mean we're we're fans so we know what's happening in the festival circuit with film and music and we've heard about bands that are coming up and we have this whole network of papers so that they, you know and we have relationships with you know uh, indie, indie company indie, indie film companies and all kinds of record companies so there's a lot of information coming in all the time but there's still stuff that comes across the transom a few years ago Charlie Satello who worked for us came and had this film called Journeys with George that was a film about George Bush's first campaign to become president and it was made by a filmmaker named Alexander Pelosi. And he said, this is really a great film. You don't know anything about the filmmaker. You don't know anything about the film, but we should show this opening night. And um, Alexander Pelosi is Nancy Pelosi's daughter. Not that anybody was even who Nancy Pelosi was at the time. But we did, we showed it opening night and it was great. And there's still stuff that comes in, you know, that somebody comes and says, you have to watch this or you have to listen to this. And, uh, and it's exciting. So there's still the element of surprise. I mean, all the time. Yeah, I'm surprised all the time. Uh, yes, sir. Rowan, would you talk about the business? You said there's 100 people that work. Rent, is it full, they're full time employees? Is it a, is it a company, a corporation? Yeah, it's um, uh, what they call an S corporation. You know, we've we been for profit. We never, never made a secret of that. You know, when we were starting off, you know, we, we talked about well, sh you know, we could be a nonprofit and do this. And, and we thought, well, everybody's going to say, oh, they're just doing this for money anyways. 
so we thought, well, let's just be a private company. Uh, so that's, that's worked, worked pretty well for us. Uh, you know, so um, we have uh, the major departments with our uh, registration. Those are the people that process all, all the people that sign up to buy badges. Uh, we have a housing department who finds hotels for them to stay in. Uh, we have a planning department. All the uh, facilities and all the vendors like the, that come in to decorate the trade show and um, do all kinds of other stuff. We have an art department who have been working around the clock producing all the publications that we put out. Uh, we have a sponsorship department, we have a sales department, and then we have the music festival department, the film festival, and the interactive festival department. And they all create the, the panels and showcases. <coughs> Takes a lot of people to, to do this. Nice digs, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we just bought a new building. Uh, we, we were like in six six buildings up on 40th Street, and uh, you know it got to the point where you know there were people that were didn't know each other, that, you know, because they were across the street, and you know they never hung out or anything. And uh, last year, it was really just last year, we, we, I always we always send out a, a survey to the staff. And is, you know, what's, what's the worst thing about South by Southwest? And, and everybody said communication between departments. And it was really at that point that I said, okay, you know, this just isn't working. We've got to be together somewhere. So you know, I started looking for uh, a place for us to move, and, and we found uh, a building uh, down by Whole Foods uh, that was big enough for, for all of us to be in the same building for the first time since we were all in the same room. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, I know the number of venues that y'all have had in the past few uh, years in Richardson, so I'm curious about how that happens. And also, I heard on the radio that there's a showcase in the dentist's office this year. I'm just curious about that. <laughs> uh, I think we have like 93 stages this year. Uh, and then there's probably several hundred unofficial shows that are going on in, in parking lots and back rooms and dentist office and, you know, uh, there'll probably be one here in the lobby. Uh, I don't think we're in a dentist's office. <laughs> What's the strangest venue that you've tried using? A pizza place in a different town. Did it work? It was weird. In Portland, in Portland. Place, yeah. And then in Portland, we also did showcases in a strip club and got picketed because we were supporting the oppression of women, even though all our people are closed. Now, are you still <laughs> doing, uh, you did spinoff events in Portland and in Toronto. Still uh -huh. doing it or not? Well, we're still involved in the, the one in Toronto. Uh, the one in Portland, we, we, we shut that down uh, for a, a number of reasons. One, you know, just it kind of reached a point and, and it wasn't growing anymore. And I, you know, our partners there were like, yeah, we don't like you anymore. <laughs> so, so we we said, okay, fine, we're out of here. And uh, and it, it turned out to be fortuitous because the next event we were supposed to do was going to start on September thirteenth, two thousand and one. So, uh, you know, if we had, you know, it could have brought it, it could have brought the whole thing down. So really at that point, though, when we, you know, we, we spent most of the 90s you know, trying to, to diversify and, and do events in other places. And it was really kind of at that point when we said, look, let's, let's forget about all this out-of-town stuff. And let's just focus on the three events that we, we seem to do pretty well. And, and really it was at that point, I think, it was when we really started to grow uh, exponentially. I think it's, I think it's 100%. I mean, when we tried, we tried in, in three other communities. Hundreds of other communities tried to do the same thing, 
and, and they would like take our, um, our our material, like our registration form, because at one point, one of the registration forms, it was a typo, and it appeared on registration forms for other things. Um, but I actually think it's it's totally because of Austin. I, I you know I always say that if you go to Park City, it's a ski resort most of the year. You go to Austin, which goes on during South by Southwest, is going on every night of the year. And one of the things that you know Roland has been very good about keeping us focused on is this is an Austin event, so we do what is organic and makes sense to Austin. And um, and there's no place with as many clubs. And I think really crucially in the early days, there w there's no place that had as many. Uh, cultbacks, you know, like the Leroy Brothers could play in Scandinavia, or you know, Lou Anne Barton or Angela Australia. I mean, uh, our friends in Toronto are friends with all the biggest bands in Canada. But if you put, you know, tragically hip in a 500-person club in Canada, um, you know, 10, 10 thousand people are going to show up. So we were lucky in that. You know, we had Joe Hilly and Jimmy Dale and Butch and and Ray Benson, Stick of the Wheel, people who were, you know, you put them in a 500 person club or a 300 person club, and it wasn't going to be a nightmare. And I think there were so many of those acts. Uh, yeah, I think the relationship between Austin and South and Southwest is you know, very symbiotic, intertwined. You know, I don't think we would have grown if the city hadn't grown. Um, you know, it, 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 all the new hotels hadn't been built, the new airport hadn't been built, you know, all of those, uh, all of those things, along with you know, the industries themselves. You know, the, Film industry's growth, uh, the, the you know, new technology, uh, information technology companies that, that have sprung up. Uh, so you know, it's hard to say. You know, what if, if, if South by Southwest hadn't have happened? You know, would Austin have turned out the same way? Uh, would you know, if, if we tried this somewhere else? I don't think it would have turned out the same way for for South and Southwest. Yeah, there was an awkward period. A couple of times when the city was growing too much and the Chronicle was anti-growth. And right after South by Southwest, every real estate agent was getting tons of calls from people wanting to move here. And the, uh, the high-tech companies were coming by the Chronicle to get stacks of Chronicles because they wanted to show potential recruitment people how great the culture was in this town. So we were working against ourselves, not for the first or the last time. But, you know, um, it beats heck out of uh, having to spend uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on a football stadium to draw people it's a hell of a lot more fun, if you ask me. But after, after 25 years, i got to say, there has been a generational shift because now I'm watching my kids do the, you know, talk about which bands or what interactive events or what films we can try to see. And maybe I'm too old for this shift, but to watch them, it's like, that's, that's what it's all about. One last question here. Uh, who brought Hugh Forrest in, and can you tell me about the first time you met Hugh? Because uh, I thought Lewis was the big <laughs> I thought, because I remember when he started the Challenger, and I kind of ticked some people off at the Chronicle, but a long time ago. Yeah. But tell me about the first time you met you and, and what he's brought to y'all. Yeah. He, he started his own publication called The Challenger, and he had something in it that pissed us off. And we were under the influence of Rollo Banks, uh, a friend of ours who was a tattoo artist at the time. So like it was like you know, a holiday, it was like July 4th or something. So Rollo said so we had to go face this guy and... and, and and take our vengeance. And uh, so we went, and it turned out to be a post office box. So I don't remember when we actually met him, but I remember Rollo leading me and Nick and some other people all hipped up to the post office box. <laughs> uh, Hugh was the, the first South by Southwest employee, even before I had a salary. Mm -hmm. The interactive event, and uh, you know, it's it's he's responsible for for you know that whole segment of what we do. Uh, actually, I think the first time I met you, uh, I was I was still at the Chronicle, and uh, part of Hugh's business plan was uh, to expand on the personals. So Nick and Lewis like called me aside and went, "All right, we really got to beef up the personals role. <laughs> you know, so what are, how are we going to do this?" And uh, so we, I came up with the idea of. 50 words, five bucks, you know, and uh, we made an ad. I, I found a, like a clip art of a, a finger pointing, and we put that in, in the ad. It said, the, the Austin Chronicle personals want you. And so that, that that's when the personals took off. Uh, 
so that, that kind of undid Hugh's publication. I don't know if you noticed this, that we, we actually destroyed his. his uh, actually, his I realized that he was told to destroy it about hunting and trying to hunt him down. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so he needed a job, so we kind of felt bad, so we hired him. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, not bad for 25 years. Here's to 25 more. <laughs> Uh, sincerely thank uh, our panelists for taking time out at this really busy time of year. Lewis Black, Joe Nikotowski, and Roland Swenson. Okay, thank you so much. But, but we, we, need, uh, we wouldn't be here today if it, if it wasn't for Tim. And, and Tim was, was right there with us in the early days. You know, he, he was uh, with us in the, the New Music Seminar in those, those faithful days and, uh, you know, always had his support uh, in, in all his endeavors, whether it was TV or, or uh, Access TV, uh, his show, Video's Choice, you know, I mean, it, Tim is really kind of one of the unsung he heroes of, of the Austin music scene. And, and, what, and what you see out here, it's more, it's more than that because we come from a whole community. Kevin Connors in the back and he was with us from the first year. He was on a radio station and Roland and I went to talk to him and I remember being shocked that there was a DJ who actually knew the music. Um, you know, Bruce Sheehan's out there, and Bruce worked with us from the very first year. There's a lot, we, we've been really lucky in working with a community that really gets it and has been supportive, and it's, you know, we're not cocky enough to think it's just us, we know that we're real lucky. Thank you all so very much. Now, now if you please make your way to the North Steps, the upcoming concerts by Schmillian, the band that was voted the best under 18 band in the Austin Chronicle poll last year. And following, and next will be Why Not Satellite. All the members of those of that band played at South by the very first South by Southwest and at the New Music Seminars. And following that, we will have a preview of the South by Southwest documentary in the park. And uh, for, and after that, we have a 1943 film of Austin uh, from the Chamber of Commerce that we've had especially revived and de digitized. So I think you'll find that interesting. So please stick around. In the meantime, we have vendors booths. There's food trucks available outside and booths from various music organizations, the Revival Fund, the Texas Music Museum, the Sims Foundation, HAM, Recycled Reads, and the Austin History Center Association. So we will remain open tonight till 10 o'clock so you can enjoy the exhibit and the exhibit runs through the end of July, so you have plenty of time to come back and really absorb it and take it all in. Thank you all very much.